sure many of you can remember bumblebees in uh, Penny Royal. And if you had horses in your paddocks, you certainly had Penny Royal there. There's no doubt about that. That's, uh, <laughs> that's where it seems to grow. <coughs> Just hope you weren't as stubborn as we kids were when we were young. So uh, today I want you to follow me in some thoughts from the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. You know, Paul had to write a letter to the Hebrews. The Hebrews were the Jewish people who had become Christians. Many of them were still wavering a bit as to whether or not Jesus was the saviour of the world. They were still in a bit of transition, moving from their old Jewish understanding and practices to where they would accept that Jesus was the promised Messiah and uh, the prophets had foretold that he would come about that time and that they should accept Jesus as the saviour of the world. They were in that transition. And as Paul wrote to the Hebrews, <coughs> he wrote to them from their perspective. He wrote to them expecting that they would understand what he was talking about. And as he explained things to them about Jesus, they would come to know that he was indeed the saviour of the world, but more than just the saviour of the world, he had something that he had to do, which he was glad to do and that he would do right through to the end of time, which uh, is very important and significant in the plan of salvation. And uh, so I want to take you through uh, a very uh, brief uh, run through on this very important aspect of Jesus' ministry that he does for us and uh, that he will continue to do until we are saved in his kingdom. So we are in Hebrews and we want to turn to chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and uh, I'm reading from uh, King James Bible which may seem a little old-fashioned in language but sometimes I will use what I call the KJC version which is the Kenneth John Curtis version which is uh, making it more simple as it goes. But I'm not going to do violence to the text or anything like that. But sometimes I'll use some words that make it a little easier to understand. It won't be very often. And so in chapter 3 and verse 1, <coughs> Paul is writing to these Hebrew people, these Jewish people, and he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Paul is saying to these Hebrews, you must consider Jesus. You see, he has been talking about this Jesus before in those first couple of chapters. He's been talking about Jesus and saying that he indeed is the Saviour and Jesus is the one whom the Old Testament prophets pointed to. And Paul quoted a lot from the Old Testament, verifying that Jesus was more significant and more important than any other person who had ever lived in uh, biblical history. And uh, then he says, wherefore, or <coughs> therefore, or you ought to uh, <coughs> consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Paul says you need to consider him. The word consider here is a bigger word than we would say when we consider things. You know, if I say you should consider uh, buying a Toyota, I'm really saying to you, give it a thought because a Toyota is a pretty good vehicle. And if I say to you, you should consider um, <coughs> trying to, to grow um, potentate tomatoes this year, you should give it some thought because they grow pretty well. And uh, we give it a bit of thought. But this word consider has a deeper meaning here, much deeper than that. It means you should give very serious consideration and study to Jesus because <coughs> he is the one who has been explained to them as uh, Jesus the Christ, not just Jesus, Jesus the Christ. In other words, Jesus the Messiah. And so uh, the Jewish people were admonished to consider Jesus. And they were to consider him in a particular kind of way. Let's read on a little bit. He was faithful to him 
uh, that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. In other words, all that he had uh, been directed to do uh, with the Israelites. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, because he who builds a house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And so he is saying to these people, you should consider Jesus because he's the one who made all things. And because he made all things, he has uh, the prerogatives of God. He is God. And uh, Paul has emphasized very often that Jesus is really God come in the flesh. So you should consider him because of that. And if you consider Jesus seriously and take him seriously and know him and see him for who he really is, <coughs> you will know that you are on the right track to knowing how to be saved for eternal life. Now Moses, in verse 5 says, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would have been spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house whose house we are, and we could use the word family here instead of house because the word house here stands for family, Christ as a son over his own family, whose family we are, if we hold fast to the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You see, we belong to the family of Jesus. So no wonder the apostle is saying you need to consider Jesus because he's part of the family. And Jesus came to this world as part of the human family. He didn't come to this world as one who is brilliant in, uh, uh, to be seen, uh, one who would frighten us with the brilliance of uh, angels who at times did frighten people when they approached uh, human beings. Jesus didn't come with a philosophy of life that was too hard to be understood by human beings. Jesus did not come as uh, one who could, uh, <coughs> who could uh, demonstrate in his life uh, something that could not be done by human beings. Hadn't Jesus said to the disciples that you will be able to do all these things that I do if you are faithful? And sometimes we wonder as we think about the miracles that were done in Jesus' day and we say to ourselves perhaps why isn't that happening today? It happened in the time of the disciples. Jesus came as a representative of the real genuine human being. And uh, he was able to and did perform miracles and did many marvelous things. But the disciples did all those things as well, even to raising the dead in the name of Jesus. And uh, so Jesus was not someone who was hard to understand. He was part of the family, part of the human family. He came as a human being. And uh, he needs to be considered. And as we consider Jesus, as the Apostle admonishes us to do, we need to consider him in two particular facets of his work and ministry to us as fallen human beings. The first part I will only mention briefly, and that is his death on the cross, his sacrifice. His sacrifice is of paramount importance because the scripture tells us that his sacrifice qualified him to do the other part of his ministry for us. His sacrifice was a ministry for us because he died to pay for the penalty of sin. And that is the universal term of sin. Jesus died to pay the penalty for every sin that has ever been committed by a good person or a bad person. And you say, well, good people don't commit a sin. Well, they do commit sins. Good people, I'm afraid, ever since Adam fell, uh, do fall as well. And good people have their sins dealt with at the cross, the crucifixion, and bad people also had their sins dealt with at the crucifixion. But for one class, it was 
effective and work for them. And for the other class, the sinner class, it is ineffective for them. Let me explain a little further. When Jesus died, he died for the principle of sin. Jesus died so that every sin could be forgiven because <coughs> he has taken the responsibility for it upon himself. <coughs> and so everybody is forgiven, but not everybody is pardoned. Sometimes we put those two together and we say they're the same thing, but they're not. You see, a person is not pardoned unless <coughs> they have a declaration made by some superior that they no longer bear the responsibility for that misdeed, whatever it is. Recently, <coughs> Lindy Chamberlain received, or she, they received a, a pardon, and recently they received the vindication of their claim that a dingo had taken their baby. The coroner, after all these years, declared that a dingo had taken the child. Well, we knew that all along anyway. <laughs> we knew that years and years ago. But uh, it needed someone in authority to make the statement and say, now you can officially say that a dingo took uh, <coughs> Lindy Chamberlain's baby. Um, it's official. And that's like a pardon. A pardon is the official statement that uh, one's <coughs> uh, misdemeanor um, is dealt with. You don't get a pardon, of course, unless you're guilty. And uh, I, don't have to, I don't get a pardon for murder because as far as I know, I've never murdered anybody and I hope I never will. So I don't get a pardon for murder. But uh, I need a pardon from the Lord for other things that I've done. And so the difference between uh, a pardon and forgiveness is forgiveness is the attitude that uh, the superior has towards the sinner or that God has towards the sinner in this case and the pardon is what can be done for the sinner to declare that they are free from the responsibility of this thing anymore. And if we accept the pardon, which goes along with accepting Jesus' crucifixion and death and his forgiveness, then we have nothing to fear. The whole business is dealt with. But if we don't accept the pardon and we don't accept the forgiveness, well then, it's all upon us, even though God's attitude towards us is one of forgiveness. Is that too hard to understand? God's attitude towards us was demonstrated in the death of Jesus on the cross because his attitude was one of forgiveness. If God did not have an attitude of forgiveness towards us, the whole human race would be doomed. And the whole history of the Bible, time and time, you can, uh, can see it, where God's attitude was one of forgiveness. But often, of course, the people didn't respect that, and they got no benefit from that at all. <coughs> so let's go on a little bit here, uh, because that is the first aspect of Jesus' ministry, to demonstrate and to show and to do that which was necessary to have forgiven us. But then there's more. It's a bit like the sales trick. Um, they have this big spiel, you know, on these uh, sales things that you see on TV. I think they target uh, the midday TV more with these big long ads and so on. I don't see them very often. And uh, then they think uh, you've received this enormous bargain, whatever it is, and then they say, but wait, there's more. And that's what it is when Paul is talking to the uh, Hebrews. He's saying, wait, there is more. And this is what he wants to tell them. He wants to tell them that the more has to do with Jesus' ministry that goes on from his ministry of forgiveness and his ministry of sacrifice. So let's go down to chapter 4 and verse f uh, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Seeing as we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast that which we profess. In other words, that which we claim to believe. 
Now he is starting to tell them about some, something about Jesus that they need to know which they didn't understand. And that is, Jesus has gone to heaven. They understood that. Jesus had been sacrificed. They understood that. But what is he doing now? Well, he has gone to heaven because he is there as our great high priest. What's a high priest anyhow? All kinds of religions have high priests. Even satanic religions have high priests. And somewhere in every religious organization in the world, there is someone at the top. And uh, we don't like to think that we have a, a top dog in our religion. We talk about the general conference president. And some people think the general conference president is equivalent to the pope. But uh, that's not the purposes of a general conference president. The purpose of it in the Seventh-day Adventist church is to have someone there who is the coordinator of the different departments of the church around the world and his work is the work of a servant just as much as any other who works for the church. But uh, in Israel, Jesus had established a priesthood and there was a graduation in the priesthood. Let's come over to the book of uh, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, and uh, chapter 40. It's the last chapter in the book of Exodus. And uh, <clears throat> let's see just briefly something to do with the priesthood that was significant to the Hebrews. So in Exodus chapter 40, and we want verse, uh, <clears throat> we'll read from verse 13, I think. Moses was setting up the sanctuary, setting up the tabernacle in the wilderness. They had made all the necessary uh, materials, the necessary items, uh, artifacts, furniture that was to be there. And uh, then he is to set it all up and get the whole system functioning. Verse 13, Thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So there was Aaron to be dressed in the holy garments and he was to uh, uh, be the high priest. And then you shall bring his sons and clothe them with coats and you shall anoint them as you did anoint your father that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus did Moses, according to all that the Lord commanded him, and this is what he did. So here is Aaron, and he is anointed, and he is dressed in the holy garments. And you'll notice that there's a distinction between the garments that Aaron is to wear and the garments that his sons are to wear. And uh, the sons uh, don't have the holy garments. You'll bring his sons and clothe them with coats. Coats were a lesser distinction in status. And so here was Aaron, and Aaron <coughs> is a high priest. His sons will follow him one day in the high priestly ministry, at least one of them will, and they are to be dressed in coats, but they are priests, and their work was to work for the people in representing them to God. Clearly, one priest could not work 24-7, although some people these days try that trick. It doesn't last for long, and they couldn't work that long, so there had to be a number of priests, and they took the people's sacrifices. They presented the people's petitions to God their, and their repentance before God, um, and they officiated at the rites and ceremonies that were done at that time. And uh, there was the high priest, there was the other priests, and Moses was also part of the priesthood. Study it carefully, you'll see that Moses was actually part of the priesthood because Moses went into the most holy place and only a high priest could go into the most holy place. And Moses went in there from time to time. Moses, verse 31, Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet at the and the wash place, the lava, 
And when they went into the tent of the congregation, and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded, and so on. And Moses set up the sanctuary and got it working. What was the object of the sanctuary? The obvious, uh, the objective of all this was that the people might know that God was with them. And the presence of God came down and filled that sanctuary, even though it was only a very simple representation of what God has up in heaven. God doesn't have something made out of goat skins and badger skins and seal skins and so on, and, uh, <coughs> and rails of timber up in heaven. God has things far more elaborate than that. But it was a representation in function. And this representation in function was to let the people know that God was there and that there was a mediator in the way of a priest between the people and God. And so if you were to take the term mediator and use it in place of priest, you would have a very correct idea of what a priest was to do. Unfortunately, the Jewish people came to a sad uh, misunderstanding of what a priest was to do. And by the time of Jesus and Paul, the Jewish people concluded and were educated to believe that a priest was a political leader and he was a religious dogmatist. That is, he declared what you would believe and what you did not believe and that the priest as one who stood between the individual and God concept was all but lost. And people were more afraid of priests than, or their mediators, as they should have been, they were more afraid of them than, uh, than they should have been. And so here we have a priesthood. Now let's go a little bit further about this, and we're into chapter 5 of Hebrews. So you need to go back there, chapter 5 and verse 1. And we read there that for every high priest taken from among men is ordained, and we just read that there in the book of Exodus, in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And, of course, this is explaining what Jesus has done. And, of course, Jesus has made this sacrifice. He's given us the gift of salvation. He's given us the gift of forgiveness. And he has made this offering to God. And uh, there's something more about the characteristic of Jesus our mediator and high priest. In verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. In other words, those who do not know these things. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And that's old-fashioned English to say that he feels things just the way that we do. We have our weaknesses, our physical disabilities, our phys physical um, restrictions, if you like. And Jesus came to this world with our physical restrictions. Jesus was no superman. Jesus did not have a brain and an intellect <coughs> um, as, uh, <coughs> as he did have in heaven. He had the intellect and, uh, of a human being, albeit a very clear mind. But Jesus was not a superman when he came to this world. He was as human as you and I in our physical form. But fortunately, he was as godly in his thinking as God the Creator. But we have this high priest who is compassionate, who is one who is considerate, who is one who thinks of those, about those who know and considers them, and uh, he thinks and considers those who don't know and have yet to learn. And so, as our priest and as our mediator, he fits the role uh, very well, and we need have no fear of his dealings with us. <coughs> Let's go over uh, to uh, chapter... Uh, where are we? We need to go to chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And verse 24. And here Paul says, But this man, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable 
priesthood. Therefore he is able to save them to the uttermost, in other words, to the very end, that come unto God by him, seeing he lives forever to make intercession for them. Isn't it good to know that Jesus will always be there making intercession for human beings? You see, he's going to always do it. He continues forever because he lives forever. And he has an unchangeable priesthood. You see, in the old days, priests changed every so often. Priests didn't live forever. Some lived a short time. Some lived a long time. But every time there was a change of high priest, there was inevitably some difference in the administration of the spiritual life of Israel. Why is that? Because every individual bears some influence on others. Every time we get a new prime minister, there is a change of emphasis on some things in our country, isn't there? And yet they're supposed to continue even though we change from a, um, uh, from a national government to a national government or to another national government, but we change prime ministers there is a change in, in uh, atmosphere, sort of, isn't there, in the political scene, in the fiscal scene. And uh, because individuals bear an influence on others. And as you look through the Old Testament in particular, you can see that various times there were high priests whose influence uh, was felt in the Jewish society. And so they, we might say there was a fickleness in the priesthood but not so with Jesus. Jesus' mediatorial work is an unchanging one. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I believe that that should give us tremendous confidence in coming to him with our <coughs> requests, with our confessions. Because we know that if we were good yesterday, and we were bad today, Jesus will treat us just the same today as he did yesterday. That's good to know. You know, there is a lot of misunderstanding, I believe, about the ministry of Jesus since he ascended to heaven after the cross. I believe a lot of people see Jesus there as someone who has conquered uh, Satan, um, he has, which he has, and uh, that he has died on the cross and uh, paid the penalty for our sins and that his work is done and he's sitting there calmly waiting for time to pass by, perhaps some prophetic period or perhaps some conditional uh, thing that should uh, occur before he comes back again. That Jesus is just waiting there at the taxi stand, or waiting in the bus stop, waiting for his bus to come back and take us home. I believe there are a lot of Christians out there in that mindset wondering whether Jesus is any use to us any further than what he did on the cross. And the Apostle Paul is telling us that Jesus has an eternal and an unchanging ministry to humanity which will go to the end of time and it will be valid for the very last human being who lives in this world before Jesus comes. He will be there to be our, <coughs> our high priest and to be our minister, mediator with an unchanging ministry. And I believe that if we can grasp that concept, we will have a lot more confidence to come to him when we need to confess our sins. And daily we need to confess and acknowledge our sinfulness even if we haven't committed any specific sin. For he is our mediator between us and God the Father who is holy and who can never be contaminated with sin at all. Let's go to, uh, to chapter 8 and verse 1. Now the things that we have spoken about, this is the conclusion. We have a kind of a, oh, such a high priest. We have one like that that I've been talking about who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens a minister of the sanctuary, of the true sanctuary, which the Lord put together, and not men. Jesus, Paul concludes, 
is the one who is the minister of the real sanctuary. The real sanctuary where God deals in reality, not in types and symbols, but God deals in reality with the sin problem of us human beings down here. We have a problem, we need to acknowledge it. And as we acknowledge the fact that we have our problem, we need someone to present our situation before God. And Jesus is the one who does that on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus always was the mediator between God and men. But during the time...